Smile. It's always show before. Yeah, oh, that's actually a better one than last last time. Hey, Steve Rothfeld, um, and I'm giving you a talk about what's new in F-Trace, and also what's new to you. So, what is F-Trace? Quick rundown, it's the official tracer of the Linux kernel. Uh, was added in 2008. Um, F-Trace really stands for the function tracer, but um, it just kind of collaborated the name for a bunch of other infrastructure that's been around. So people call it F-Trace, where it's actually a misnomer. F-Trace is really just about the function tracer, but the whole infrastructure really. So I, if you look in my uh, uh, patches, you'll see tracing whenever I do everything that's about tracing. But F-Trace is usually when it's about the uh, function hooks. Um, so when I designed F-Trace, uh, I was an embedded developer. So I used to I made sure it worked uh, on the embedded system. And I was just telling someone earlier uh, at lunch that when I developed F-Trace, I actually had a PowerPC 64-bit Big Indian box. And when I was writing it, I was actually doing code both on x86 and uh, PowerPC at the same time to make sure it was even. And Dave Miller gave me a great compliment a long time ago. I don't know if he remembers this. Um, when he ported it to Spark, he said to me, he's like, wow, it took um, 40 minutes for me to port it over. And most of that was in compiling. So thank you, David. That was actually one of the best compliments I've had. Remember that. Uh, but if you want to know more about F-Trace, I'm not giving you a talk about F-Trace itself. I'm talking about the new stuff. If you don't know about F-Trace, um, go watch the other videos. So why is this talk? Um, so on Twitter, I mentioned some feature. Uh, someone said, like, oh, yeah, you can do this on F-Trace. And someone else replied to me and said, wow, I didn't know that. That sounds like a great feature. And they said, I never heard of it. And I've been using F-Trace for years. So that was one thing. I'm like, wow, maybe I should, you know, do so or think about this more because one time, this, you know you've done too much when you go and you say, okay, no, it would be cool if F-Trace had this feature. And then I found out it already existed. And I wrote it. <laughs> I need to write a book. Because <laughs> that's like at that point, because I said, if I ever start writing, going to features and throw you there, I know it's time to write a book. Anyway, what's new? Actually, what's new to you? Um, K-probe tracing. This is something that's very popular. A lot of people use it, but a lot of people don't even know about it. Because I talk about, oh, just use K-probe tracing. And they're like, wait, you can actually do K-probes from F-Trace? Uh, sometimes they think this was a BPF thing. Um, so a lot of people don't know about it. Uh, you could dynamically create trace events uh, from, uh, for the kernel from the TraceFS file system. Uh, it can safely walk pointer directions, and I'll be showing this today. Uh, something new that happened recently, uh, and someone asked me about this earlier, is that it has this special variable called arg1 that allows you, if you put a k-probe on a function, uh, a start of a function, uh, instead of having to memorize which register that function, the first argument of the function is, you could just say uh, dollar sign arg1. Caveat, if you have like a structure or something like that, no, it's just the first register that's used. So if it's, you know, if you know about um, how compilers work and everything. Sometimes the arguments aren't quite in the right registers, but most cases they are. Um, they're a little bit complex, so not everyone always uses them. So if you go into the documentation directory, uh, things are completely documented in the documentation trace kpro trace .rst file, you'll see a bunch of things. This is just like the format of how the kpro tracing works. Um, got, you read all that, right? Uh, next thing I know is like, okay, for this example, I wanted to do something that I used to do all the time, and that was um, I wanted to trace incoming packets. And there was a function called, I remember what, way back when, when I first started working on the kernel, which was 2.2, uh, there was an IPC underscore receive function. And when I tried to trace on it, I got nothing. And I thought, whoa, is this broken? No, actually, things have changed a lot since 2.2. And so I did this, um, oops. So yeah, so I did a list of IPC and I said, well, there's four different functions that this could be. So, okay, trace CMD, trace command. I'm going to use all trace command things because I don't really use the tracefs directory uh, directly anymore. I always use trace CMD or trace command, whichever you want to call it. Um, so I did a start uh, with the function dash L means limit and I put IPC star um, and it, it just basically traced everything that starts with IPC receive just so I could see what the functions are and said, oh, here's one, IPC uh, receive core. Let's look at that one. So I went to the um, source code. Yes, I'm still on IPv4. Uh, I'm still, I keep people say, come on, enter the 21st century, please. And I, I like the 20th century. Anyway, I went to the file, the, into the networking code, and there's the uh, start of the code, the functions, and you'll see that there's an SKB uh, b uh, parameter, and there's a net parameter. So I'm like, hey, perfect example. Let's see what those parameters are. So 
I went in back in, I do trace command reset just to clear everything up. Right? That's a really great tool because it does clear up things that are hard to clear up by hand. Um, and then this is the format that Kate probes is. So first thing you do is you say, okay, echo P, which is probe, you could give it a, the, the next option is uh, optional, uh, but if you want to give a name for the trace point, so I want it to be called IP underscore receive, otherwise it gets some kind of archaic name that's based off of the function name, uh, which is IPC receive core. And then I said, okay, SKB equals dollar sign arg1. So it's going, the argument of the first argument is going to go into this variable called SKB. The second argument is going to go into a variable called net. I type it into the, in the sys kernel tracing directory, which is where traceFS exists, if you have it mounted, uh, into a file that's called kprobe events. So I echo that, and then I do a trace command list. I'm not actually, like I said, I'm not using traceFS as much anymore. I'm using trace command. These are the commands to do list. There's, you can do this all from traceFS directly without with just echo and cat. But list shows you what the, well, the list will tell you what's available, the dash E with what available events. So I say I want to see what the kprobe events are. The dash capital F means print out the, um, the fields of the, uh, uh, of the event, and dash dash full will give you the uh, print statement at the bottom. And I see that there is actually an event, once I did that echo, an event was created uh, with the SKB and net fields attached. So when I ran it, I said, okay, trace command start with the dash E, IPC receive, which is the event that I just created. Um, remember, I, I named it that. And then trace command show, which shows the trace buffer. And there, I got it. There's the uh, argument one, argument two. Boring. Why? Wow, this is useful. By the way, this is like, one thing it is useful for is if, you know, if you have root, yes, uh, it gets past that case that case or whatever it's called. Um, so uh, if you could get into the trace of S directory, you just basically circumvented all the uh, security that's on the machine. Because trace, trace, uh, F, the tracing directory is basically made to see what's going on inside the kernel, and security is supposed to be about keeping people from knowing what's going on in the kernel. So they kind of have opposite uh, things going on. But this is that why it's admin only. Uh, only privileged users have access to TraceFS by default, but you can change the, the permissions if you want. Anyway, that's mostly useless, except for, like I said, rootkits. Um, so let's look at the uh, uh, SK buff. And so I know there's a struct SK buff that this pointer is. So let's look at the header file and see what the SK buff looks like. And then inside there, there's this thing, it's a union, it's kind of complex. This got really complex over the last, what, 20 years since I, you know, since 1998 was when I was looking at the, you know, the kernel, the networking code, and now I'm looking at it today, I'm like, wow, I don't recognize it anymore. So there's like a union, a struct, a union. Um, but hey, I'm just going to guess that this still is the, the variable I want. I'm going to assume it is. But there's a, um, you know, net device there. That looks interesting. Well, let's go look at that device. So I go and look at struct net device, and there's a very uh, first value is a name. That's a char, char uh, value. That looks like a string of size if nomsys. And then I'm like, okay, let's use GDB. So I go and use the GDB kernel of my, uh, I built a kernel. I'm a, I have the debug symbols, so I pull up uh, GDB, and this is a little kind of trick I like to do, where you print the address of zero, typecast to the structure you want with the dereference to the, uh, va the field you want, and you get the offset. So this is basically offset of, of that value. So I know that um, 10 hex, 16, is the offset into that uh, network device. Did the same thing for name, which was kind of useless because it was the first item. I knew it was going to be zero, but I just wanted to show that it was. So the next thing I do is I did this. This is where things become fun, interesting. So I take the arg1, and what you do is kind of like think of it as assembly. You put a parentheses around it, that means the reference. And then the offset by 16 or 10, uh, 10x. And then you put another parentheses to dereference that point. And say, okay, dereference it, give me the zero. And let's see what happens there. Well, this is zero there. Boom. I got dev with a bunch of, I'll use mouse so people can see on the screen. Here. So I got dev here. And this last thing here, that looks interesting. That doesn't look like a pointer. Those look like hex, uh, those look like, uh, hex characters, or uh, ASCII characters. Still boring, because I don't feel like translating ASCII characters to actually strings. So I went back to the documentation, and at the bottom of that documentation, there's this thing called type, and there's this thing called string, that you can define types of fields. So this time, I defined the, t I did the whole dereference, and, and then defined it that this is a string. 
And then when I ran it again, and then at the bottom you can see how it's like the whole format. And then I run it again, and look, voila, it shows me the network interface that of all the packets coming in. Boring, I only have one network interface, so I kind of knew what it was going to be. Exciting. So, next, uprobe, uprobe trace. So, like I said, people have heard of it, people know of it, but not many people use it. Um, so it's just like k probe tracing, but for user space. In fact, I don't even really use it because I really don't trace user space. Well, I may have with my new job. Anyway, uh, it's triggered via breakpoints. And the documentation is here. Do you want to go look at it? So for this example, I said, okay, let's look at libc and find malloc. Everyone knows malloc. At least you should. If you do C programming, you know malloc. And I found the address of it right here. Boom. That's the address of malloc in the libc. So then I do this. I do trace command reset because I had to reset my uh, k-probe stuff, so I didn't want that involved anymore. And then you do a p for the probe. I'm going to call it malloc. And then you pass in the file that you want to attach to colon by that offset right here. And then I said size, and unfortunately there's not a uh, dollar sign arg for u probes. I mean, we might be able to add that later. So you've got to know that the first parameter is the um, uh, RDI, but you take off the R when you thing, so it's just the DI, so it's architecture specific. So if you did this on ARM, it'd be something different. Um, but you put in the parameter there that you want. And then because by default everything's in hex, and I don't want to see the hex of size, I typecast it to uh, unsigned 64 um, uh, bit number. Ran it, and boom, there. I got to see all the sizes of uh, malloc right here as it ran. And it was basically the bash doing a bunch of stuff. Ignore this right here. That's another talk. So um, another little option that you could do, um, and this actually kprobes has the same thing, is if you change that first p to an r, it's the return value of it. So now I, when you put the R in there and I attached it, and by the way, what I did was I concatenated it. I didn't write to the U probe events because if you write to it with a normal uh, greater than, that's truncate. So basically, it would delete my old value and replace it. I wanted both. I want the start and end, so I concatenated it so I could add to it. And this time, also, by, I know that RAX register is the return value. And then I did that, and not only that, that I get to see the sizes, I also see the return values of all the ballots that happened. So it's all user space addresses. And if it was important to you, great. But for this talk, I really didn't care. just wanted to show. These are just examples. Next, histograms. Uh, this has been around since 2016. Again, new to you, not new to me. Um, they're enabled by what is called the event trigger. It's basically a file in TraceFS under every single event. So basically, you have the events directory. And underneath that, you have all the uh, event group directories. And underneath those, you have each event has a directory. And in those, they, that's how you have the enable file to enable the event, all this stuff, filtering. One of them is trigger. So histograms will count events. And it's documented here. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, let's find an event to do. So I'm thinking, what's a good event to do a histogram on? What about system calls? Well, there's raw system call events. By the way, just to let you know, when you go into the events directory and see all the system call events, they're not actually, tr they're not hooked to trace points. Uh, they're actually kind of a pseudo event that's hooked onto the raw trace points. There's only two trace points in the kernel that are for uh, system calls. And that's right at the entry of the system call, and that's the raw syscall. It's sysenter and sysexit. So if you see other things, you'll see sysenter, like open at, or read, or write. Those are actually just pseudo calls that attach to this uh, trace event. So this trace event is the main trace event for all, um, or trace point, for all uh, system calls. So I want to see, let me take a look at the system calls. And the ID of this event is the uh, mutex, or the, you know, the value that's passed from user space to the kernel to tell you what system call this is. So I go into, um, since I'm not using trace command for this, there is a way to do it, but actually it's easier to do it by hand. So I go into the uh, tracefs directory. I'm root. That's why there's a hashtag there. And I echo colon, or I echo hiss, which is the name of the trigger, colon, keys, what do I want to, you know, have a histogram on, the ID value, and I pipe that to the raw syscall sysenter into the trigger file. That's right there. I cat histogram, and boom. I see all the system calls, and how many counts? Wow, number 14 is a lot. Not very helpful because I have no idea what number 14 is. I can look it up, but who wants to do that? 
we're lazy. So in the documentation here, there's a little value of how to kind of like name values. And there's one called syscall. Huh, how does that work? So what I do instead was, instead of just saying keys ID, I say keys ID dot syscall. And I run it there, and voila, got names. And number 14 was sysrt sig proc mask. And sysclock get time obviously is high. So you get a nice little value uh, things there. That's helpful. All these like U probes and trace events and all these events that you create, they're real trace events. So anything that those trace events can do, like a normal trace event could do, you can do on the made up trace events. So for this example, I said, you know, let's create a histogram on top of one of my U probe events. So the one we just did, malloc. So I said, okay, I have this malloc uh, trace event. And inside there, um, no, I see common PID. The first four instances there, that common type, common flags, uh, everything that starts with common is made for, is all trace events have. That's, that's, that's why there's a space there, and after the space is the, the fields that are specific to that one event. So I, I'm interested in the common PID, which is the process ID that triggered the event, and the size uh, of the mallet. So this time I put, I want the keys, I want a key off of common PID, and I want to a collective vows. Vows means it's going to be accumulative, so it just keeps, it'll, the bucket will be on the common PID, then I just see how much is allocated, it will grow as I do, and sort it by size as well. And when I do that, I get to see all the process IDs and how many times the, the hit and a total accumulation of how much has been allocated. Obviously, there's I didn't put free in there. I could also match free and see and then balance it out, look for leaks, whatever I want to do. Um, this is just for demo. I didn't think about it. So it's sort of useful because I have no idea what these process IDs are. So going back to the documentation, there's this thing called exec name. Now, no, exec name only works on common PID, which is a special value that's only on the trace point. So if you have something like sketch switch that has a process ID inside the field, this won't work because this common, this exec name will actually get it from the actual process that is basically current. So it will look at current, and if, so that's why if one of the fields is PID, it won't work because the current isn't there. It's just a process ID, and it doesn't know what that process ID any more than you do. So I add kexec with exec name, and voila, I get to see all the processes that are executing, the hit counts, and it shows you the process IDs up on that as well. That's better. Let's take you to the synthetic events that came in 2018. Still, you know, not really new, not new to me, but new to you. Uh, I knew people weren't using them because after a couple of years I tried playing with them and found a ton of bugs that if anyone was actually using them, they would have hit the same bugs and complained about it. They probably used it and said this doesn't work and went on. I fixed them now because I wanted to use them. So what synthetic events do in the real-time world, this, is, this actually was kind of pushed by the real-time world, is it takes two different events, any, any event that you want, and puts them together to be a single event uh, that you could run. So you could show the latency between them. You could pass some information um, back and forth between the two events. Um, so it uses histograms to create them. And it can pass variables and such. So it's documented in this file right there. So everything's basically in documentation and trace. There's a lot of good information there. So how do we do a synthetic event? One of the reasons why that people don't use it. Um, so I go back to the TraceFS directory. And I'm going to create a wake up late. I want to wake up latency. So wake up late. What I mean is I want to see the time between a task is woken up and then between the time it actually schedules onto the CPU. Simple thing. So let's take a look. So the first thing you do is you create the uh, synthetic event that you want. It won't do anything. It just actually creates an event, and it, it does nothing. It just allocates fields. So I say, OK, I'm going to call it wake up lap. The first thing I want is I want to re record the com, the, uh, the current, you know, the, the name of the event, or the name of the process that uh, is being woken up. So I'll do char, name, bracket, kind of see, like, um, you could put a number in there too. So if you put a number in there, that means it's going to be a fixed size, or you could put brackets, it's going to be a dynamically allocated uh, string, so it could be any size, tool limit. Um, the process ID, using the PID field, and um, the time delta between the two events. And I put that into the synthetic events file. Now I have to create the, uh, the first event, I have to attach to the very first event. So I'm going to find, go into the, um, look at the uh, sched, sched waking events, and it's going to be using the trigger. 
So I'm kind of talking backwards here. So I'm starting back here and I'm going forward. And I look at, I put in the hist, the keys. This is important, what the keys are, is the PID is the key. Because that's the thing that's going to be mapping to the next event. So the keys is what's going to be doing the mapping. So I put PID. I create a variable called TS1, timestamp number one. Now variables are global, so every single synthetic event has to have a unique variable name. So TS1 says why I've used again, put TS2, TS3, whatever. And I'm going to make it to common timestamp. Now remember I said all the fields that are global to all the events start with common, but if you look at the, the format file, you'll notice that there is no such thing as common timestamp. Reason why is because it's not actually part of the event, it's part of the ring buffer that does it. So, but you could get the information of the timestamp by putting in common timestamp and tells the kernel saying, okay, you want the timestamp that happened when the event triggers. And by default, it's in the normal field, which is nanoseconds. And I really don't care about the nanosecond um, resolution, so I prefer microseconds. So you just tack on dot usex, and then it will truncate it to make it um, easier to read. And you pipe that in. Now it gets a little bit more complex. <laughs> this is the mapping of the second event to the first event. So the sked switch. So I'm, okay, this is how I do it. So, so I'm going to, right into the sked switch. I start with the keys. Remember I said the mapping. So the wake up PID is going to match the sked switch next PID. So next PID is the process that's being scheduled onto the CPU. So I'm mapping that process ID to the uh, PID that's being woken up. And that's going to be the match that's going to trigger the synthetic event. Then I want the delta between the um, current, the timestamp of the sked switch minus the timestamp of the uh, wake up, which was saved in the TS1 variable. So I could say common timestamp dot usex minus the variable back in. Then I say I want to match, this is telling it you're going to match another event, ideally, which will be the sked waking event. And then when this matches, when this match happens, when this variable matches with this, when these, this key, when the keys match, it, that tells you what keys you want to match. Then it's going to trigger a trace. And that trace is going to call that synthetic event that we made earlier in the very, very beginning, passing it the com, next com of the field. Next com is actually the field of the sked switch event. That's the, that's the name of the task that's being scheduled on. Well, with the next process, the process ID of that task, and the dollar, so by the way, if you notice, whenever you reference a variable, you need a dollar sign. So when you assign a variable like TS1 equals, that says there, but when I reference the TS1, I have to put a little dollar sign in there. Think of it bash, okay? So think of this as like bash, like I always tell people, F-trace is kind of like uh, shell scripts. And you pass that in. So then I'm going to do, look at, see what was created. So I did a list of the event with the full thing of the wake up lab. And there I see it's a dynamically allocated uh, name followed by the process ID, followed by the latency. So I start the wake up latency and I do, I look at the dump of the trace and boom, there's all the, the latencies, there are all the, uh, the traces that go in on there and I see the events, the names, and the latencies of the wake ups. Um, like I said, you could attach histograms to any event, which includes synthetic events. So let's create a histogram. So now I want to see a histogram of all these. So I'm going to put a histogram against the name, the latency. Dot buckets means that I don't care. I don't want an exact uh, histogram. By default, the histogram buckets are one. So I want to group them by groups of 10. So I put dot buckets equal 10, sort it by name and latency. And I just, after I did this, I should have done it the other way around because it kinda, you don't see the nice latency graph there. Um, but when I did that, you here, you see all the uh, wake up latencies there. Well, there was kind of like a big one there, I remember, right there. Ooh, something was, took a long time. That looked like, a, I should take a look at this one. One that took about 74 milliseconds to wake up. And that's, wow, that's slow. It's a keyword. I didn't investigate. Didn't have time. I wrote these things yesterday. <laughs> so, see, very easy to use. It's like bash shell scripts. I don't know why people are not using it. It's trivial. I'm sure a lot of people have heard the joke where the, uh, there's an English professor saying that, you know, a neg two negative words can make a positive, but two positive words can never make a negative. And someone yells, yeah, right. So, now, what's new since the pandemic? So this is stuff that's COVID years. So it's actually new to me. LibTraceFS has bi been released in 2020, uh, finally. It's a way that it's a library that's easily accessed um, pretty much um, 
anything you need to do in the TraceFS file system, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, it's been extracted from a trace, trace command. Trace command actually uses this. I'm trying to get Perf to use it. I'm trying to get other people to use it. It's uh, LGPL licensed, although people think that that's sometimes a problem too. But uh, well, almost everything. Uh, it's always a p cat and mouse thing because I like to develop in the kernel, and then I realize, oh crap, I don't have an interface for trace, lit trace FS, but I'm trying to keep up as um, close as possible. It's written in C, but we have actually something that makes it uh, work also uh, attached to Trace Cruncher, which is a Python module. Um, it's an interface to make histograms and all these wonderful things. Full man pages are here, so if you go to the, uh, tracecommand.org, you'll find all every single function has a full man page to it. Right, Mike? Um, with lots of examples. Some examples are better than others. I really make sure, actually, if you do like make samples, it will extract code from the man page and build these samples. So I can actually test the samples that are in the man page. So much so that the trace SQL one, oh, I, I somehow deleted the L, typo, um, has an example that creates an application called SQL hist, which I'm going to show here. This is, it's a very simple, it's, the SQL hist is small enough to fit in a man page and it has its own man page because the SQL uh, file, or the trace SQL uh, function actually has a, uh, uh, what's the word, quite powerful that you'll see. So, normally we see this crap, which, okay, the fact that Tom Sanusi was the one that actually created this, myself that uses it all the time and maintains it, I have to look up the documentation to use it. So if Tom and I, who created this, he just too, he said, he goes, yes, I have to always look up the documentation on how to use it. If we have to take a look at the documentation and use it, you know it's not intuitive and people are not going to use it if you can't do it. So, I did this, SQL hist. So here, if you notice, there's, for I don't know how many people know SQL, there's a select, there's as, there's from, there's join, there's on, there's where, why. Um, <laughs> so, look at this. It's get waking. I'm going to think of it this way. This happened at the real time summit on the summit, which happened is on next week, and I can't be there because I'm going to be in Vegas with my wife. But summit on the summit is this real time summit that happens on top of the mountain, and we um, <coughs> we brought this up. I said, how may, how can we make uh, histograms better to usable? And uh, Lucas, uh, I can't remember his last name, uh, said, you know, it's kind of like tables. I was like, what? He said, each event is a table. Every field in the event is a column. Every instance of an event is a row. Why don't you use SQL? And I was like, really? And when I looked at it, I was like, oh my god, it's almost a one-to-one -one match on how to join two events into a single table. It's just it's a table. So the first table is sked waking, the one I want to start. So I'm starting from sked waking, so I'm from. And then, by the way, the way this works, it, because I have it's all user space and I can do a lot, I have fun with it, and I got to relearn Bison and Flex, Flex. Um, so, so it had an SQL part, so I was like, oh my god, how am I going to do SQL? And I had my, uh, what, uh, Lex and Lack, Yak book, and in the back, there's a SQL parser in the document, <laughs> in the book. I was like, this is awesome. Anyway, <laughs> I didn't have to look very far. It's in the book that I have at home that I've had since the 1990s. Um, anyway, I uh, was able to easily parse this. So you could say, if that's get waking at start, once you do that, even in the from, you could use start anywhere else, and it will actually replace that start variable with sked waking. So you don't, so it's really easy. You can start writing to say, okay, I know it's my end, and this is start. And then when you get to from, you say, okay, this is what the from is started. In fact, I just cut and paste a lot. I don't have to look up anything. I could just write this from scratch. I don't have, no more, um, it's very intuitive, intuitive, if you know SQL. Uh, join, the join, that's how you connect two tables. Uh, the end will be sketch switch, and I label it as end, and I throw end all over the place. So if I look at the sketch, like the first thing I do, the echo with, uh, that comes from the very first select. So the select will say, oh, okay, these are the fields that I want. So when you do select, you want to pick the columns that you're going to read. This is what goes into the synthetic event. So I want, you know, end next com as name. So that name pops down as the name. And I'm like, you know, start PID. PID is already the PID. If you don't put as something, it uses the name. So it'll be PID, and, it, and if you notice, I don't put in the, uh, what, the, what they uh, are. It actually, this is smart enough to use the TraceFS directory, it looks at the types of the events, and it knows that the name is a string, so it creates a string for it. It knows that PID is a PID type, and it will create the PID. So you don't even have to know that. 
you don't have to know what system. Like, so if you notice, there's no. Um, it doesn't look at the um, sked waking. It doesn't. It figures out that oh, this is in the sked group. It will find where it is. So this does all the work for you. Um, and then here in the delta, I say okay. I just put in this parentheses. Okay, I want the n dot timestamp underscore usex. If I just put capital timestamp, that will be nanoseconds. If I put timestamp underscore usex, that's just uh, the, the the trace SQL will convert that to the um, conversion. And then as latency, latency goes in there. So yeah, that's the second thing. Um, you'll see here the second part, which is the uh, uh, from yeah. So the from sked waking that will create the other things. It knows that uh, has the match there with the start PID equal, you know, where it says on on start PID equals that. It knows that okay, we need to put the keys as PID, and then we'll do the timestamp. And then for the second part, it does all the magic work that you don't have to think about anymore. It says okay, I put everything together. I have all the information I need to make this from this SQL statement, and boom, it's there. So fun with SQL. Hits. So that was that's, that's my end here. But last night. Um, Harold uh, Zeiler, Zeiler, how you pronounce your name? Uh, he asked me this question. Um, and he didn't even know about this presentation. He just said, "Hey, Steve, is there a way that I can see one how long tasks are blocked for something, and what system call did it?" I said, "That's a great example for my talk." So I start off with creating a synthetic event. Um, I did this last night, by the way. When I first showed it to him and said, yeah, you can do it this way, it didn't work. Uh, Trace SQL had a bug in it, which I fixed last night. I sent out the patches. Uh, he gave me tested by, so they do work. The patches do, but if you actually download it, Trace Command right now or Trace FS, it won't work. So wait for those patches to get in. Uh, <laughs> it's just what I call conference-driven development. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I said, okay, give me the um, sys name. I'm just going to call it sys name. I don't know why. Uh, I'm going to look at this. Remember, this is the system call. This is from the raw events. Remember that we looked at the raw events? So I'm going to look at the ID. I want the ID, and I want the n event, because it's going to connect to sketch switch from what gets scheduled out. So I'm going to say, I want the previous ID. Previous ID is what's scheduling out. Remember, next ID is the one scheduling in. And then from sys enter, which is the start event, which is the sys enter raw trace event, there, as start, join sketch switch, where I'm going to uh, connect uh, the ending event as end, where common PID, remember I said everything has common PID, will match the previous PID of the sketch switch. And now here's a new thing. You can put where in there. If you know SQL, where is a filter? So I'm only interested in things that are being scheduled out, the previous state, in the task interruptible or uninterruptible state, which I know, happen to know is number two. This is something you have to look up. I would, I'm trying to find ways to make this easier. But if you know that, the th or, or you can put and two, it will actually take um, binary flags checks. But I just know that number two is where things are blocked. So that gives me the latency from, that actually gives me a synthetic event from when the system call happens to when the uh, task schedules out. I just care about the information. I don't care about the latency there. So. I'm interested about when something schedules off in the task interval state to when it schedules back on again into the running state. So let's create what well, I use this name for an off CPU. So I create a, synth a synthetic event called off CPU, which means that it's not running, it's, it's blocked, it wants to run, where I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to jump to the from, um, from sys name, which is a synthetic event that I just created earlier, um, past um, as start, join sked switch, which is the scheduling, the scheduling event, again, it's funny, it's starting from the scheduling event to another scheduling event, uh, where I connect the previous process ID or PID to next PID. And I want it to give me the uh, timestamp between those two events, so when it's scheduled off to when it's scheduled on, give me the latency, and the ID, the com, as com, blah, blah, blah. Um, by the way, I also notice there's a, a dash E up here. Uh, that dash, without the dash, if you put dash N, if you run this, it gives you the print statement of, remember the, the all the echo statements I had, when you run this command, it actually dumps out those echo statements, so you can actually cut and paste it if you want to put it onto another machine. You can just run this code on one machine, so if you're on an embedded world and you don't have trace command on that thing, you just or SQL hiss, you can run it on your machine, get the stuff, and copy it over and put it there. Um, so, and dash E means just execute it. It will not only print it, it will actually execute commands as well. So, I go to I don't like said histograms. I have to write uh, a tool to make it a little bit nicer. But then I just went into the trace cam and say, okay, I want a histogram of all this. So give me the ID with syscall name, the com, the lat, and run it, and boom, there. 
which is kind of interesting because I see this huge 85 uh, millisecond latency on sys fsync. Who would have thought? Now, event probes. This is new, new. 2021. This is uh, last year's work. So, um, so event probe is actually like a K probe, but you attach it to another event. And you can attach it to a K probe or a U probe or a synthetic event. Um, it ex you can, so you can either limit what you see or you extend what you see. Because you could do the extensions like um, uh, K probes. I went to point to the documentation for this and realized I never wrote it. <laughs> so I have to like, crap, I forgot to write the documentation. No wonder why no one's using it. <laughs> so it's very new to you. I'm the only one using it. Anyway, so I was like, okay, the networking example, I like that one. So let's find an event where packets come in and say, hey, there's netif receives um, that. I go down and I say, hey, there's a um, SKB uh, address, and I know that that happens to be a pointer to an SK buff that we already know, because remember when we back did the K probe example and we had the dev equals this offset, offset, offset into a string, we did that? Well, we could do that with event probes. So based off of the, the, uh, the pointer of the, um, of the event from the net IF whatever trace event, or trace, yeah, trace event, I'm using the field, you use dollar sign, the dollar sign field, which means, so you can see the first part, I, I called it my event, I named it my event, my new event called netdev, and I put in the, the trace event that I'm going to attach to, and then I say, okay, the dollar sign is all the fields of what I'm going to attach to, I'm going to offset it, give me a string, Dynamic events is the new file. It's in the same tracefs directory. And when I go and run this, I get the same data that I did with the kpro. Easier to do. So let's even go further. Let's look at uh, open files. I want to see all the files that are open. So I look at, uh, I do a list of sys enter open. This is actually the enter the open app, which happens to be, open's never called, open app seems to be called everywhere. So let's look at file name. And we're going to you know, do is reset. I'm going to create event probe attached to the enter open. I'm going to say, okay, I want the file. I'm going to offset it. And I use uString. No, you got to use uString. On some newer kernels, they have to dif they differentiate for security reasons when you get access user space to when you access uh, uh, kernel space. So if you put string in here, you just get a bunch of faults. It'll just, it won't crash. It'll actually, it detects it. It'll just give you a fault. It'll actually say fault. And uh, um, so you have to say uString telling the kernel that I'm talking to use, use space, and, and same thing, if I use uString with the other code, it would give me a fault. So you have to know what type of address you're looking at. I run this, and I can see all the files that are being opened. And then later on, I looked, and wow, there's a fault. That's what it looks like when it actually hits something that would, cra would normally crash, but it does it safely. You get this fault. And I'm like, why did it happen? So I wrote some code. I wrote this really thing. I said, okay, give me a little application. All I'm going to do is I'm going to open the Etsy password file, and then close it and then exit. So I ran it. By the way, when you do a start with a dash cap left, that means only follow this application. So I, that open at is an application. It's not a, that open at name is the uh, name of the file that I just wrote. So that's, that's this guy. I compiled it, called it open at. And um, I showed it, ran it, and sure enough, it faulted. Anyone know why? Okay, so what happened here is the file uh, that I have, the pointer to the file, is the um, password. It's, it's, a, it's a different address space. You notice I didn't pass the name into the, to the uh, what's it called, the function or the open system call. I passed the name, uh, address to it. So if you know how things work in the kernel, things are, you know, pulled into memory on just, just in time. So the file address wasn't pulled in yet. So when it called, once it, it went into the kernel and it triggered the trace point entering, the, the, that Etsy password wasn't pulled into memory. And trace events can't, uh, can't fault and they can't uh, schedule out. So all I could say is, oh, there's nothing there, give you a fault. So it will fault for you. So you can't get the information. So that kind of sucks because when we first did this, we needed all files. For the application that we were using this for, we needed all files and we couldn't find it. And this, it was giving us too many faults and it was a problem. That's the problem. So, um, Let's look at what happens on the return side of the trace event. So when I look at the return side event, so sys enter, you have sys enter open at, and actually this should have been, I did a cut and paste, wrong thing, that should be sys exit open at. 
So please ignore this. It's just exit open app. So for those that just look at the slides, they'll be confused. And at the sys exit open app, there's a ret return value. So hey, I can get the return value as well. So remember my SQL hiss? So now I said, OK, I'm going to do my open. I'm going to attach the you know, sys and I'm going to some from sys enter open app. And I'm going to join it to sys exit open app and combine the two. And I say, give me the file name and the end. And then I want you to print it. Well, guess what? It does this, pro the, the, this synthetic event gets triggered at the end of the, or at the second one. The second one is the return of the system call. So the kernel, when it goes in, it's going to read that file. Now it's going to be in the address space. Because it's not going to flush. It could possibly flush it, but so far we have not seen it flush it. And so on the return side, and not only that, this actually gives us a bonus point. We get to see the return value as well. So when I did my sys, um, um, uh, the, the, what's it called? What's the join uh, Oh, when I created my synthetic event, I this time I put the event on top of the open uh, synthetic event, so the exit. And now I'm going to dereference it to give me the string. And then when I run it, this time I get the file. So, coming close to the end, I know it's basically the end. And that's the end. And I've, I got to get this in because I promised um, someone now that I have this. Boot config. Enter, um, send the kernel command line. So everyone knows the kernel command line, but it's only limited and you only do so much. And when we started doing tracing, we wanted to do a lot more stuff at the beginning of boot. So Masami Hiramatsu worked on boot config, which is an extended uh, version of the uh, command line. So you could attach a G, uh, the file to uh, RAM disk, or you could attach it to, um, as of 5.19, I just did the pull request, 5.19, um, you could do actually attach th this to the VM Linux itself. It's an adjacent format file. And if you want to look at the tools, it's in tools boot config in the kernel directory. And this is an example of the one of the files I use. So it's a JSON file. You say ftrace. There's documentation on how to parse this. So you have uh, ftrace. I'm here. I'm enabling the function graph tracer. I'm going to enable a few options in the trace buffer. I'm going to say make the size of the trace buffer one meg. I'm going to do uh, alloc the snapshot buffer. I'm going to turn set the global clock. I'm going to uh, set all these events, the task, two task events, the init call events. I'm going to do some filterings on scheduled process exec. I'm going to create a bunch of kprobe events in there. I'm going to do, um, also I'm going to create a new instance. That's one instance. I'm creating two instances. One that does this stuff and another instance that does a function tracer, but it will keep tracing off. Sorry. And then, um, you know, turn, um, what's it called? Dump on oops only to the CPU. So I did all this setting. And, that's, and this is the way to, to load it. I'm not, unfortunately, I'm running out of time, so I have uh, no examples. Uh, but this is how you load it onto NetRD. As of um, 519, there's actually an option in menu config, general setup. You could look at it there. Processing types, features. Um, you have to enable these things. This is what you have to enable. Um, and finally, my last thing I have to talk about is custom trace event macro. So if you look at the, um, this is where it can be done by modules on any existing trace event. It's in samples. Here's the samples where you can look at uh, how to do it. So if I look at the set switch trace event, you'll see it's important. The first part is very, very important. It gives you the first part is how is it creates the trace point that goes into the kernel. The second part is what you see in the in that in those um, uh, format files that I've been showing late earlier. Um, and the bottom part is how it's designed. So if I look at the sketch switch event, here's all the events. If you look at it, that's 64 bytes of data. If you look at the offset, the last one is six, six, uh, 60 byte offset, four bytes long, so it's 64 bytes off it. We have we're at Chromebooks are going to have this on all the time, um, and we're going to be able to get this if you obviously with your permission. So we want to make it smaller. So we create a custom trace event that maps on top of the sketch switch event. And it has to, the first part has to be identical, but you can change the second part. And then when I look at this here, what our custom trace event, we're only, only extracting what we want, which is only 16 bytes of data, which is a huge savings. And we, uh, we could record a lot more without worrying about overwrites. I got just, these are just um, nicely mentioned. There's new latency tracers. Daniel Bristol would be mad at me if I didn't mention this. You have the timer lat. This is all real-time stuff. OS noise. These kind of supersede the hardware latency tracer. But he's giving talks about this in other conferences. I, I don't know why he's not here. And by the way, I could draw too. <laughs> he's not even looking at me. <laughs> and finally, thank you. <laughs> I don't know if it's time for questions. <laughs> by the way, that was 165 slides. So there, Thorson. Up there.
There's some, there's some up here. Um, I saw in the mailing list something also about a new way to define trace points from users, but it's to do right now. Do okay. Anything to um, add? Yeah. So what we're doing is I have to uh, I I have to look at that too. But we actually we now have a tracing meeting among people from Google, Matthew De Noe, Ziri uh, Osa. Uh, I can't I can't pronounce his first name. Uh, you know, Perf um, that we meet and we actually invited Bo as well to come and we're all discussing it. So we it's, it's we want to do it right. So it kind of, we started, I kind of threw it in too quickly. Alex Say got mad at me uh, for doing that. So, and then we just kind of pulled things out. We're like, okay, this is going too fast. At the time I was started a new job. I was kind of focusing on other things. I really like, yeah, yeah, that's good. I just put it in. Uh, I didn't even know it touched BPF. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, we're basically taking a step back and we're, we're, it's still going forward. Or at least something will be there. It may not be what you originally saw. And we're actually looking at, oh, another thing we're looking at starting a project on called Lib Trace Point which will be specific for uh, user space events so that we can find a way to attach to user space and have a way of go, uh, writing to buffers in user space with shared memory so it doesn't have to go to the kernel so it's much faster that way. Or maybe even set it to the kernel as well for those things. So we want to basically abstract, we want to make an abstraction layer first. So that's what we're working on right now. It's all in development. Okay, thanks. Uh, so to kind of from embedded recipes, the possibility to show so that uh, support to show function arguments and return values directly to F and the series is going to be discarded because you can that with you question mark. Wait, what well, the uh, the the K probes did the uh, arguments. That arg dollar sign arg one arg Yeah exactly two. exists. But there yes. the, the patch Oh is that patch series rejected because you can do that with k-probes? Well, or I mean the one with the function one. But with the that, that do all functions. But there is okay. So what we do is we have patch. We have a patch that's already in there that all F in x86 when you run function tracer you have access to all the arguments without saying give me the full regs. Every function tracer has access to the arguments. So what we want to do is right now we, we're working at trying to do, tap into BTF, which is the uh, type uh, format which defines all arguments. And I need a way to find a way to make a hash table to connect to a way of recording. So every function that gets triggered will go to this hash table and say, OK, this is how you record it. Just dump it into uh, the ring buffer. And then on reading side, have a way to um, uh, give you the actual nice format using BTF. So there, if you want something nicer, right now the only thing is you can get any argument by what the uh, K probes could do it. With the, that's one of the reasons why the dollar sign R came out yeah. was because of the patch series from before. I see. So K probes. And then only six, no, the, your prototype only exists on x86, right? The well, no, the, the, the code that gets everything is, or was, and I had like a prototype that just said, hey, oh, I mean the, the patch that just said, I had an example patch of how to use it. If that's what you're talking about. That just said, here's the thing. I could throw that in there. That was more of just an example of how to use it. It wasn't, it was more of an RC of how to use it. It wasn't, it was a prototype. It wasn't a push that did I all see. functions, like the first six parameters. And um, Christian back there is raising his hand. <coughs> He's like getting uh, antsy. Hello. Uh, this is probably a naive question, uh, but you, you mentioned Mathieu, and uh, they maintain LTT and G, right? Yes. Uh, and something that I quite liked about it is that you can track process all across user space and into the kernel um, yes. straight through. And my naive question is, how far along are we to make this possible without having external kernel patches? Because LTT and G depend. It's a yeah, module, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, like I said, part of our tracing, we just started a tracing meeting, um, I, like just a couple months, or a month ago or so. This is really what I want. Like, I'm, I'm yeah. you know, use trace to figure out yep. what system call and use, I don't know, EVPF, uh, yeah, BPF trace, and then get you the return value via a KRED probe. What I want is to say, attach to the process and then trace it straight through user space to the kernel and back. <laughs> Give it two or three years. Hopefully. Uh, but this way, with my new job, I'm doing a lot more things like that. So I, it's something I want. Next. Did I exhaust you all? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>